Welcome to the Running For Real podcast, where each week we bring you a conversation designed to help you create positive change in your life, community and planet. It's a collective of conversations about running, the climate emergency and social justice. Running For Real is for the brave, for those with courage and vulnerability. United by our love of running, we're driving momentum towards some of the really tough challenges we're facing as humanity. So come join me, Tina Muir, and let's get started. Hello, my friends. Welcome to episode 238 of the Running Field podcast. And welcome if this is your first time listening. If you are a Running Realized fan and you have found your way over to Running For Real, I am excited to have you here. If you are a loyal listener, welcome back. And have you checked out Running Realized? Um, it's been, the feedback's been really great. And it's been wonderful to see people enjoying it. And we put in so much work for this. So we're really happy to see it coming together. And we have a new episode dropping on Monday. So if you have not already subscribed, go do that right now. I can give you a little sneak peek. It is actually about women's leadership, women's coaching. um, And it's going to be just about the impact of having so many males in the coaching world really, really powerful episode. So go subscribe to Running Realized if you have not already. Okay, so we are on Running For Real. You did not go on to the wrong show. We are on Running For Real and I have an extra long episode for you. It's actually a double episode for you. And that is because this is a topic that I probably should have covered in detail a long time ago, but have not. And now it is time that I decided to do it because I got connected with someone who you will hear, strangely enough, happens to live in my old hometown in England, St. Albans, um, but she's actually from Nepal and she is going to have, she's got a very interesting story. She is now the um, CEO and co-founder of a business, uh, which is the UK's first period underwear brand. So this episode is going to be focusing on periods. And that doesn't mean if you're a guy, you can just switch off and go out. Maybe you will learn something. You have probably a girl in your life that you need to learn this about. Or it could just be a case of you want to be able to talk to the people in your life who understand. So um, I would encourage you to stay along. But if you do not want to, I understand that is okay. Um, All right. So yes, we will have Ruby Rao on the show for the first half of the episode. She is going to be talking about her, her brand. I have no affiliation with them. I just really enjoyed her story. I enjoy her like learning from her and just appreciating her. And um, I really wanted to to bring her on to talk about some things. So we have her on the show at first. And then the second part of the show, we'll be having Dr. Megan Roche, who you may remember from a previous episode with her husband, David Roche. And yes, that is the power couple who um, are all over the trail world. They are a power coaching couple. They run races themselves, have been very successful. And I wanted to bring Megan on just to talk more about the logistics of periods, because once I started thinking about this and now I've started thinking about running um, in the ultra world I, th- I thought about how logistically how does that work and that led on to me thinking that I haven't ever actually discussed this so this is the second half is going to be more of an in-depth um, conversation about periods what they are what happens to our bodies how to negotiate it what we can think about keeping the environmental aspect in mind but also um, as you will hear Meg is not particularly pushy with um, sticking to environmentally friendly items, although she would prefer it. Um, So yeah, it's just a great episode where we can all be learning a little bit more. And I think we will just take a moment to thank one of our sponsors. We'll be right to the episode with Ruby and then in the second half with Meg. Thank you to Gooder for sponsoring this episode of the Running For Real podcast. I have been wearing my Gooders for years. I probably have six to eight pairs and I love them. You can see some of my favorite uh, colors and products and uh, glasses by going to gooder.com forward slash Tina. That's G-O-O-D-R.com forward slash Tina. You've got some of my favorites up there. Uh, But I want to tell you a little bit more about Gooder today. Uh, I'm tempted to start with the fact that they are carbon neutral. That means that they are putting back, uh, the, they're doing initiatives that are helping to balance out the carbon footprint that they are putting into the world. 
um, you are going to start to see that a lot more in the future. I suspect we are going to see this all the time with companies uh, really putting a focus on carbon, but a lot of that is going to be performative as they see everyone else doing it. Gooda has been doing this from the start. Uh, they are also a 1% for the planet member, which means they give 1% of their revenue to environmental causes and um, groups that have been vetted out. Uh, but the main thing that they are known for is their quirky personality to go along with the sunglasses. You may have heard uh, Stephen Lease, who is the CEO on the podcast just over a month ago. If you haven't listened to that one, you can be sure to go back and check it out. Uh, we talked about what they call Pineapple Gate. We talked about his history. We talked about good art, and, but in a very much natural and uh, fluid way, not a one giant ad episode way and that episode has been shared a ton by you so I really enjoyed that you appreciated that one and we're thankful for that one uh, but good as sunglasses they focus on what they call the four F's that, which is that they are fun fashionable functional and affordable as in you can remove the first A and the F so it's affordable uh, so they want to focus on look good run gooder they give you free US standard shipping uh, for your orders of over $50. You have a 30 day free return, although I doubt you will be using that. I love my goodness, every single pair of them. They don't slip, they don't bounce, they are polarized. It's none of that horrible glare. I, I can't think of much worse than running in a pair of sunglasses where you get that glare and it just makes, I, I can't think of anything worse. I, I hate that so much. Um, but there's nothing, there's no, that is not the problem with Gooda. I really, really love some of their products. You can see all kinds of fun styles and patterns to, to match your personality. The OGs are those classic shapes, no slip, no bounce, polarized. Good for what they call normal sized heads, which thankfully I fall into. They have their BFGs, which are wider frames, longer arms and bigger lenses. So <laughs> those are maybe, you don't really want to say you have a big head, do you? But uh, maybe uh, there is no real nice way of saying that, but you get my point. They have the circle OGs, which are, as you can imagine, more of a circle shape, and the Mac OGs, which is their Gooders plus Aviators. I have a pair of these myself. I love them. People often are surprised to see that they are Gooders, but they are. Um, they're really comfortable and just love those Aviator styles. And finally, they have the Superflies, which is the wider lens coverage in a lightweight package make them pretty unique and there's all kinds of styles and patterns that you can go check out so you can go to gooda that's g-o-g-o-o-d-r dot com forward slash tina g-o-o-d-r forward slash tina and that will get you 15 percent off your first order uh, i am working with gooda in implementing some kind of give back program that is something i feel really passionate about so stay tuned for that and uh, thank you to gooda let's go meet our guest Ruby, thank you so much for joining me today on the Running For Real podcast. I appreciate you being here. Thank you so much, Tina, for having me. I'm really excited to be here, actually. Really? really? Uh, want to... Yeah, 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 absolutely. Because uh, this is one thing, as I was well, saying to you in the background, that running is something that I never got into. I mean, though I was a very athletic when I was growing up, uh, I used to do heptathlon, so pretty much oh. all aspects of athletics. Uh, but running was something I always felt the hardest part. Yeah, <laughs> I, I'm, I'm saying this now, but really, I used to like, and even now, I whenever I have like my training session and stuff, I think the hardest part is the last part where my PT makes me run, <laughs> and yeah. that's like that's the most difficult, and I, I pant so much <laughs> in the end. I think that's a pretty normal thing to say. Uh, it's hard because being most people listening to this and being around runners, we forget that for the average person, running is not something that you're like, it's part of your daily life. And, and as you said, to most people, the running is the worst part of any training that they do. So uh, you are definitely not alone there, although most people listening probably are have to think about it to feel that way. So in that regard, this is not going to be a typical podcast episode, but I feel this is very important to address, especially as I think, I don't know if you know this, Ruby, but in the running world, I think in some ways I am known as the girl who got her period back. So yes. my <laughs> name is very much associated with this topic. However, I've never actually addressed it in this way on an episode. And your story is definitely worth sharing, thinking about, and just with perspective. So there's a lot of reasons that I wanted to have you on today. Now, um, growing up in Nepal, 
but you are now the CEO and co-founder of a business in the UK, actually the UK's first period underwear brand. Now, when you look back on your childhood, did you see any elements of ambition from an early age? Because that's a pretty big thing to to have done for, for anyone, let alone uh, a, a woman, a woman of color, someone who grew up in the pool and has now started a business in the UK. Uh, tell us, can you see anything looking back? Yes, I think, um, you know, you start seeing like how ambitious you are when you are quite young, actually. Mm. I, and my mom and the people who know me actually tell me like how I used to big dream, uh, like dream big, you know, like when you were young. And and since since very early age, I had this this ethos of very hard work, you know. The only way that you will ever get success is through working hard and working smart. And, and I think that's what paved the way for me. Um, because yesterday is a bit of a luck, but, uh, and, and something that I never say is like, I never stayed with hope. Like you either do it and you get it, or, or you, you don't hope and sit and wait till something comes to you. It, it doesn't work that way, you know? Um, and I've always been a bit more opportunistic whenever the opportunity came. I try to like leave everything behind and go go with it. And yeah. that's something that happened. Uh, I guess I got the opportunity to come to UK, and that was my golden ticket. You know, like to get away from I think very patriarchal society and and make something out of myself. And mm-hmm. yeah, very. Uh, uh, I mean, I think the first work that I ever did was I was uh, 11 years old when I was carrying. Um, sand in my head to complete that complete my parents house um in nepal and and that since then i was like quite determined to like okay this is how people work how people make money you know and then you move on move up that way so yeah i've, I've been quite ambitious yes since very yes. young yeah, thank you for sharing that very interesting to hear and i uh, i want to go into your story about you know what all the little things that led into you starting this company. So to, to, to frame it here, to really set the scene for why you uh, founded this particular uh, company and product, can you tell us about what happened on your first period and just explain that this is not a typical thing, a, a, a rare thing for, for you. It was, this is, you know, the way things were. So tell us about that. Yeah. I think it's it's never a typical thing for any girl, a young girl, like to have the first period. It's like I, I, either scary or shocking, or you get like quite relieved because you got period and your friends already had like a few months ago. It's always various kind of emotion I think to have first period. But my my first period and many of Nepalese girls' first period are very different to the first period that you have in Western countries. Um, I was actually given like my mom literally handed me are all saris um, cut into square pieces and made into a pad, makeshift pad. And then she said, like, okay, here are your eight pads. You're going to your aunt's house and, and basically locked in one room. You're not allowed to see any men, boys. You're not allowed to go out of the house. Uh, you're, you'll be given a bowl and a plate and a cup and basically treated like a prisoner. And that was, like, 12 years old. The only time that I, I think most I needed my family around and then they, they go like, okay, you can't stay at home because your father can't see you. So it's, it's a very scarring process I think, so, for yeah. any, any, any young girl. And, and, and I still yet been, you know, like I still cannot figure it out. Like why did my mom think that it was okay for me to go and stay at my aunt's house, but not in my own house? Have you figured that out now? Well, whenever I ask my mom, then she goes like, but the, the times were different, you know, those kind of things. Like we had to oh, listen so it to our changed. own. It had changed. Oh, yes, definitely. Not in, in my household, in my family, nothing like that happens ever again. <laughs> and you said about uh, not being able to see any men. Uh, what, what was the, the reason behind that at the time? Um, you are untouchable, basically. And then that's what it literally translates is to as well in Nepalese. Period means natune, and natune means like untouchable. So you can't touch anything. Um, any plant to touch will die. Any pickle, 
if anybody is had make, made a pickle in a jar and you touched it, the pickle would rot. Those kind of myths, wow. you know, which never existed, obviously. But because it's been passed from grandparents to the parents and onwards, and and because I grew up in a culture where you don't question anyone, you know, you don't question the elders. There's never a question, why am I doing this? You just get told that you need to do this and you follow it. And I think that that was one question that always bothers me. And and to my niece and like nieces in Nepal, I say like, you need to question, you know, you need to ask why why we are doing what we are doing. And that's the only way that we will figure it out and break any taboos around anything and, yeah. and, and follow the more scientific reason to actually what's happening. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I, I appreciate that. And uh, it's not an easy thing to do. I, I got to imagine for, for anyone to, to question something that, like you said, has been going on for a long time, but obviously has done if things have changed since that time. Uh, and after that first period, was, was that the same thing that did you have to do that every month and and was that part of it not questioned in terms of you know being untouchable being someone who essentially would you know kill anything they touched or rot anything they touched uh how did how did the fact that it came around once a month that never changed the narrative it didn't we we, again this is the question of like not asking the question and and it continued maybe i didn't go to my aunt's house every month but i every month I didn't go to kitchen and still now today till date um, there are many girls who don't go to kitchen who don't cook clean who don't do anything and this is partly because you know in very olden days a woman had to do all the house chores so this four days five days used to be like almost like a break from yeah uh, all the chores so in a way I think they would they did love not being in the kitchen and not doing all the household work uh, but the other thing why they did was they never had the men- proper menstrual products to use. So they used to end up like um, just putting the sari rag in between their leg and just sit down. And because you don't have a proper menstrual product, yes, there would be blood everywhere. And, and that was the unhygienic part, you know, then that's why the whole patriarchal society said like, okay, you are dirty. You cannot be around here. You can't be around okay. this. And that's how it started. Uh, but it still exists. Um Things are changing, but I think we need to educate the parents, grandparents, and tell them why actually period happens. And the period is the fundamental reason that human being exists. You know, like we are here because of the period. Yeah. We, we like appreciate every aspect of birthing and everything, but how can we say it's dirty and untouchable to the only thing that actually make, can make it happen? So, For sure. Yeah. Although you said about uh, the birthing being spoken about and beautiful, I don't know if I would agree with that. In I mean, I think for, for people who have been in it and been through it, uh, that would be the case. But from my experience, people who, you know, particularly uh, maybe men who haven't experienced it, there is, and I would say women too, there is very much a... Um, a negative uh, about it um, in terms of that experience uh, fr- from, as we say, something that's so beautiful that comes out of it being a child. So you you would say you think that overall uh, the birthing process is seen in a positive light? It's, it's, it's a giving a life, I think so. And it's yeah. definitely from the culture where I come from, it's quite celebrated. Like, if you know, somebody gives okay. birth to a baby, it's, it's like a big thing. Uh, and... Yeah, the whole experience I can totally understand. I can't say much because I don't have children of my own. And I think I I have this definitely a fear of like having giving birth to a child, especially Mm -hmm. the older I get, the more I see, you know, Uh, the more knowledgeable I make and the the more pain I can feel of people. It's slightly harder. It gets harder and harder for me actually to have a decision of like having to give a birth to a baby. Uh, that's, that's my personal opinion. Like, um, but yes, uh, cultural wise, they are quite celebrated rather than disgusted, you know, like periods are more <laughs> disgusted than. That makes sense. Yeah. Then that, and that is true. And although, yeah, I would say changing slowly and that's what hopefully this episode will continue to do. Now, one other element I want you to just tell us off, uh, is tell us about the menstrual huts. I mean, this is one step further and, and you didn't have to do this, but, uh, what is a menstrual hut? 
So menstrual hut is basically a tiny house or a hut or a cow shed, uh, which is out of the house uh, where women, especially in far western part of Nepal, are sent every month uh, while they are having the periods. And every winter, pretty much every winter, you will hear a story of like somebody suffocated and died, either them and their children together. It's, it's, an, it's an illegal practice. Um, it's been illegal since 2005, but because the culture is so deep-rooted, people are still following it. Um, and you will still see quite a lot of menstrual hut in far western part of Nepal. Um, the reason why women and girls die is because in the winter, especially, they try to keep themselves warm. Yeah. And the, the hut is so tiny and so small, you literally have to crawl into it. And when they are trying to keep themselves warm, either they, they put fire or smoke inhalation, the hut is also quite far away from the home. So there are chances of like snakes coming in. As, with a snake bite, people die quite a bit um, as well. So I think the recent one was uh, the woman actually took um, her, her daughter with her to keep her company and both mom and daughter passed away. And it was one of the most saddest story, you know. Yeah. It's 2021 20, and 2020, and you still hear this kind of story happening all around the world. It's, especially in the, in, in the country that I come from. And I really feel like there is definitely so much work needed to be done in terms of like breaking that stigma, you know, to, to normalize periods. For sure. And uh, we'll get on in a little while to talk about what your intentions are with the future to continue to change that. Um, but uh, just for anyone who is thinking in terms of, oh, that's really hard for people in Nepal uh, and, um, you know, that's tough for them, but it's not like that here. Now, um, you know, many girls would have skipped school uh, and maybe still continue to skip stool uh, in Nepal. But um, what about other women around the world? Uh, can you tell us a bit from your research about what you have found about women not being able to afford sanitary products all over the world? So this is something that I learned coming to Nepal. And, and I think it came only in the news in 2017, 2018 time, when there was a huge crisis about a period poverty. Now, period poverty is when uh, happens when a family cannot decide whether they have to feed their child or buy a menstrual product. Mm -hmm. And sadly, it's very common in pretty much every country. And we are talking here in the UK as well. Period poverty is quite in the high rise among many families, and especially during the lockdown. And um, it has like increased by another third of it. So. I think um, period poverty is 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 fun. Like I, I cannot like, especially coming from a third world country, a developing country, to the, to know the fact that girls here in the UK cannot afford like two pounds pads a month. It's quite shocking, you know. It's mm -hmm. and it just shows like there's so much needed to be done, either in education and awareness. Uh, or like just the provision of menstrual product. And luckily, well, I'm sure that you've heard the news, Scotland became the first country to give actually free mm -hmm. menstrual product to everyone in the whole country. And that was like a huge success. And that was like, you know, the fact that you know now that every girl in Scotland will actually have the access to menstrual product. And that's a, that's a huge win for everyone, every woman kind. Yeah, yeah. And uh, I love that you are pushing uh, the rest of the UK to to go for that too. Uh, and I feel confident you will be a part of the movement to help them get there. Um, and let's talk about the sustainability side of this. You've said yourself that um, you are a passionate environmentalist. So um, tell us about, you know, how, where, where did that part of you come from? Um, Thinking about the environment and, and what was that growing up? I think growing up, like I still, people are still around me get surprised when I said that. It, I was 20 years old when I had my first mayonnaise or ketchup um, <laughs> because we never, we never got it. And 
I never ate any canned food or baked beans. You know, it, it was like everything was new to me when I first came to the UK. So I always, I grew up in like an in, in an area where everything was fresh and found fresh. You didn't get any plastic bags. You know, you I used to end up going to the shop and the, the shop, uh, the supermarket was more like you get first your potatoes and then onions. And then right at the end used to be the tomato. So when you are taking your uh reusable bags, you know that your vegetable is not going to get squished. Had the tomato be in the front, <laughs> obviously it didn't get squished kind of thing. So, so the, even the market was laid out in a certain way. Um, it was only when I came to UK and I did my degree through Open University in Environmental Science where um, part of my project was to look at the waste management um, and how, where does the waste go basically. And yeah. um, how much waste we create. Um, it really shocked me to see the sheer amount of the things that we consume every day, especially in here in Western countries, which is far more, more than developing nation. Um, yeah. And then the amount of packaging and plastics and that everything comes in, it, it was huge. And that led me to like, okay, I want to do something related to environmental science and, and focus my work. Uh, onto it but I think part of me always wanted to do some kind of social work like something that benefits the the people as well and especially women and girls coming from began from a very like patriarchal society I, I say this quite a bit because I think I was almost like shaped by the fact that I wanted to fight men in terms of equality and stuff mm -hmm. um and uh and part of that was teaching young girls about reusable menstrual product. And I was t sharing them my story of using sari rags, which were super comfortable and, and sustainable, but not so reliable. They used to literally yeah. fall, fall down whenever we used to do sports and stuff. And while I was teaching that, then I almost had a light bulb moment. Like, how come I never thought about, like, almost stitching the pad that I use into the underwear and make it like an underwear, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. And just wear it, and you wash it, and it's uh, it's reusable, it's washable, it's it saves so many pads and tampons going to landfill. So, just came home with secondhand sewing machine and started making like some underwear patterns from my uh, husband's old T-shirt, and that's all where it started. Wow, I I love that you. I mean, that in itself shows the ambition uh, that like entrepreneurial mind to 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 take that problem that yeah you'd experienced fully uh growing up and to be able to figure out a solution and when you were thinking of this were there other were there any other companies on the market there when were, you there started were to few, research yeah, yeah i think there were a few brands some in america and australia i think american one was the only i remember but mm -hmm. they only did like a leak proof underwear so on a heavy day you still had to wear tampons and pads and for me, it almost like defeat the purpose of making a period pants. If it doesn't mm -hmm. do the job and if you still have to wear pads and tampons, why bother? So my, my main, main mission was like, how can I make one underwear that actually does the job and you don't have to use anything else, you know? Yeah. So, um, yeah. And, and that's, I, that's what I launched with, with one underwear, one style, you know, black, comfy, uh, more, almost like a granny pants who... We absolutely love, I guess, whenever you're on a period, like you just want a comfy pair of pants mm -hmm. and, and a pants that does the job and holds the yeah. floor for at least what, six to eight hours. Um, so Yes. No, I appreciate it. Thank you for sharing that. And we'll dive a bit more into that in just a minute. I do want to say to any listeners um, that although I haven't tried uh, the Wuka pants, which by the way, stand, stands for wake up, kick ass, which I love. Um, <laughs> I have tried, I have been using period pants, uh, well, in between my pregnancies, I suppose is all I can say. Um, and, uh, I, I mean, it was such a game changer for me to, to, yeah, not even feel like I was on a period to not have that, uh, discomfort or to just be stressed about it. Um, I really, just have been so impressed with them. So we'll talk about it a bit more in a minute, but um, I just want to give some numbers to people listening from research that I did. Uh, and I can put links in the show notes to this research. Uh, the average woman uses up to 12,000 tampons in her lifetime. Uh, here in the US, around 43 million women use tampons. Um, 
and the and then if you think why well, use pads so i'm okay um a uh, the average menstrual pad is estimated to be 90 percent plastic uh with the average package of those disposable pads containing as much plastic as five disposable shopping bags and those products will uh, estimated to take 500 years to decompose so i just want to put throw that out there for just letting people think about the sheer volume of this um yeah. but one thing i want to go into before we go more onto onto the the pads and themselves and some of the questions oh, sorry the pants and some of the questions around them um when you were 20 was when you moved to london uh, you moved there with your nepalese boyfriend to study health and social care mm -hmm. um but it was maybe not the ideal uh, situation you would had hoped it would be uh, and I'd love for you to explain why, and then maybe even explain to us if this is maybe the reason you do think about the patriarchal uh, society so much because of what happened to you then. Yeah, so so obviously I was in a relationship and my only getaway card was to be away from his family and my family so that I can actually do a full breakup. <laughs> now if I'm going like a full disclosure kind of thing, like, uh, I had already had that in my mind. Had I stayed in the pool, I'd be still with the same person, still standing the views, maybe with few kids, not thinking about my future at all. That would be definitely would be my situation, you know. So my getaway card was like, how can I be far as far as possible from the family so that they don't pressure me into being in a relationship that I really don't want it to be in. And 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 when I came here and and thought, okay, maybe things might improve, but it never did. And I think that was one of the best decisions I ever made. It was like to, to break that relationship and move, move on, you know? And yeah, I think in a way that was, yeah, I think that, I think that, that is definitely one of my <laughs> best uh, decisions ever in my life to actually turn it around. Uh, and sometimes you do have to take that step. Um, it is hard especially for me coming into a foreign land, I didn't know anyone. There had been situations where I was left with no money and no place to live. And, but, but I, I pulled myself together. At, at one point I was like, either go home or stay here being homeless and or figure it out for your life. And, and I'm glad that I, I pulled myself together and uh, made some out, something out of me. Um, but also I'm glad about so many people that I've met in my life, during, especially in those kind of troubled times, who are still in touch with me and they're like my parents and, and I'm incredibly grateful for that. <laughs> Honestly, like yeah. they were the right, you know, those are the moments like when you need somebody and they come in the right place and right time. And I think mm -hmm. um, those families were one of them and I, I'm still grateful for them. Thank you to Generation UCAM for sponsoring this episode of the Running For Real podcast. And friends, have you seen the new items that UCAN has in its uh, arsenal? Is that the term? In its shop, I guess would be the correct term I would be using. UCAN now has granola or an energy mix, as they call it. And I love it. There is a vanilla one and a chocolate one. This energy mix is just so good. Although I will say... It does say there's multiple servings, um, I think eight servings. And I definitely mowed through the first bag that I had in maybe two or three servings. Um, so it is absolutely delicious and so hard not to not to eat the whole thing. So it's got um, the chocolate one that I really like. It's got almonds, sunflower seeds, pumpkin seeds, cashews and chia seeds, all good stuff. And of course, you can super starch, chocolate flavoured. It is just a really yummy breakfast to have. It's good for snacks. It's good for let's be real, walking past and grabbing handfuls of however you want to have it. I absolutely love it. And in addition to that, you uh, can also has almond butter. So you can almond butter. They, it is delicious. It is easy to enjoy. You can put, I mean, what can you not put almond butter on? I am known for having um, almond butter on my sweet potatoes before races. I actually have not tried that, but I haven't been racing, so I haven't really had the need to, but uh, I will let you know once I do. It is absolutely delicious. There are so many good things you can go check out on the UCAN website, but going to ucan.co and using code Tina UCAN to get 20%, go get yourself some of that energy mix or get yourself some almond butter, or you can go get those uh, 
bars that I always talk about and just devour every single day. Everything is wonderful. They are a great company to be working for and you are going to love it. So go to youcan.co to get yourself some now. It is hard, especially for me coming into a foreign land. I didn't know anyone. There had been a situation where I was left with no money and no place to live. And But but I, I pulled myself together. At, at one point, I was like, either go home or stay here being homeless and or figure it out for your life. And and I'm glad that I, I pulled myself together and uh, made some out, something out of me. Um, but also I'm glad about so many people that I've met in my life, during, especially in those kind of troubled times, who are still in touch with me and they're like my parents. And, and I'm incredibly grateful for that. <laughs> Honestly, yeah. like they were the right, uh, you know, those are the moments like when you need somebody and they come in the right place and right time and I think Mm -hmm. um, those families were one of them and I'm still grateful for them. (laughs) Yeah yeah thank you for sharing that and I'm sure they are appreciative of having you in their life as well. Now you um, this uh, boyfriend of yours was uh, physically and mentally abusive and and you kept quiet for three years because of uh, Asian culture domestic violence is this taboo that no one talks about so you said that you you took you turned your life around you you got got out of it but what gave you the courage to eventually do that uh, the situation would get worse had i'd gone back home i think so um at the end of the day they will try and patch it up and think like okay whatever happened we'll forget about it and you'll move on and things will be better and I was determined that I don't want to go back home because I will be in the same situation and I will be never be able to say no to my parents who really think about good about me. And um, I think my mom was really understandable, but she definitely comes on under like a peer pressure from her family or her friends, mm-hmm. you know, to do something. Um, I think being away was a good, good for us and good for me to explain how the situation was from my perspective. And um, yeah, I, I was determined that nothing will be better if I go back home. And, and if something will happen, then it will be here and I will make it myself, um, yeah. make it happen. And yeah, you make a decision, you lay on it, you know, and you try and thrive on it, hopefully. <laughs> and uh, luckily I did. Uh, and th- this might not be the case for everyone. You know, many, t- many of my friends have gone back home and, Many of my friends are in a not not a healthy relationship, and it's quite sad to see that. Yeah, I uh, I mean, I haven't I haven't experienced that myself, but I I can imagine how tough it is. So moving on to the next part of uh, your life, the the thing that came into this, um, you I thought this was so interesting. Uh, after speaking to schoolgirls in. St. Albans, which happens to be my hometown uh, in the UK, you realize that not only did women not know about recyclable options when it comes to their period, but there was a gap in the market. So you'd already had this idea. Um, you were starting to, to think about things. Um, but tell us about that experience with um, being in, I mean, St. Albans is I would say middle class, maybe middle upper class uh, women and have the money that they need to to have, have the ability to be able to uh, purchase products that, you know, could benefit everyone, but obviously don't, didn't know about them. So tell us about that experience and why that was important. I think um, when I went to school and talked to girls, only two of them actually knew about menstrual cup. Um, And few had seen cloth pads uh, because some of them came from, uh, Muslim family and um, and I think some of the cultural barrier kind of thing people some mm. people still use cloth pads uh, but I, when I when I obviously that was just my idea right I, I had to make something that actually people say like oh yeah it works and I would like to try or yes I would buy it kind of thing so uh, when I started the prototype obviously I had to try it first before I even went anywhere else so I just went to the supermarket and bought some, um, oh, like hipster, like high waist pants. 
Um, yep. And then basically bought two underwear, cut both edge of the side of the underwear, inserted some old t-shirt fabrics, and then stitched it together to make one underwear. Um, and I, I wore those pants myself for my two periods. And then only I got that guts and feeling, okay, it works. It's comfortable. It's slightly tight, obviously, because I saw, <laughs> saw it and, <laughs> uh, and it was smaller, but, but it works. That was the only thing like it works. That's a good, good sign. So my next instinct was like to go to local Facebook forum and see like if anybody would like to do a survey on, um, on period products and how comfortable they feel with whatever they are, how reliable they are. Should there be an alternatives and eco-friendly one, would they be willing to try it? And uh, overnight I got nearly 400 and 500 responses, like literally less than 24 hours. So that was like quite shocking because I never had done any market research and I didn't know how people are responding. And one of the community that I did was running community. And I got absolutely overwhelming comments as well. Like, yes, definitely I'll be like willing to invest um, time and money into this. Uh, what are you thinking of? And there are many people who are already saying like, I use cloth pads or menstrual cup already. So definitely will be willing to transition to something sustainable. Um, so that was like a great boost for me to do something. So I managed to source some fabric and uh, try different absorbent fabric as well. Um, some, some came from America, some came from here UK, some in Europe, just to try and see which one actually absorbs, uh, which one doesn't make you feel wet. And um, basically took it from there and went to one of the oldest lingerie manufacturer here in the UK. It was in Wales, in like middle of literally nowhere. Stayed with them for three days and um, made nearly 30 to 40 underwear. Came back home. I went back to the forum again and said like, anybody would like to try a pair of pants? Like, give me your honest feedback. You know, like, um, it's not a product yet, but I'm just testing it out. And the response was absolutely amazing. Like, from the day after, I literally had random people knocking at my door coming inside and saying like, I would like to try the pair of pants and changing in front of me. And it was just like, okay, this is happening, you know? It was yeah. quite exciting. Um, and and th these women came from like all walks of life. And we had a lorry driver, we had a stay at home mom, we had a, like, uh, you know, somebody who works in the city and runners and uh, people who were just given birth to the babies. and. Um, trans women, you know, like they were like people from everywhere, like willing to try it and see how it works. And um, within a month, two months, I started collecting data. And the only response I got was like, that's so comfortable. That's so comfortable. And that was my like main, main goal. And like, whatever I make, whichever kind of pair of pants I make, I'll, I'll make the most comfortable one. And still now, I think we get like so many reviews about like how comfortable the other words are. And obviously yeah. they work great as well. Yeah, yeah. And uh, I mean, I think that is the word, uh, as I said, I have not uh, tried Wuka directly but uh, mm -hmm. myself. But uh, I mean, I, I would say that is a word that com when you compare to um, – using the other products, it, that is the word that come to, comes to mind, comfortable. Or, um, and so I love hearing that. And, and what a dream for a business. I mean, talk about like, that's kind of the, uh, the, the dream story of something coming together. You know, you've got all these pieces of your life that lead to this moment, this idea, and then you start putting it into practice. You ask people that are interested, they go for it, they try it, they love it. I mean, um, I love hearing that. And, and in just under six months from what I, I read, you, uh, the team stopped 1.3 million tampons and pads going into a landfill, which is a massive amount. Uh, yeah. And now you're into the next stage of this, which is uh, getting the government to recognize period pants as a menstrual product and taxing you at the 5% that single-use pads and tampons are currently taxed at in the UK. Uh, I actually am not sure how that works with in the US, but um, tell us uh, about, yeah, you're deciding to put your energy there. What would that change for you? 
So the good news is actually the VAT from all menstrual product has been removed in here in the UK. So tampons and pads, you don't pay any tax anymore. So it is great, right? But mm-hmm. period per pants, the government has failed to recognize as a menstrual product. So the government thinks that the period pants are clothing item, and hence we are taxed at luxury tax of 20%. Mm. Um, I started this actually when I launched the business, uh, because one of the things that you have to do is after a certain amount of thresholds, you have to register that as a VAT registered business. Mm-hmm. And when, we, when I went to do that, um, I asked them, this is a new product. When you go to the sanitary product category, there's no period pants. So either could you please remove the, uh, add the period pants in there, or could you tell me like what, how it is rated? Then a woman actually <laughs> sent me a letter saying that they're taxed at 20% because they're a clothing item and there's no evidence to say that they are period pants and it can be worn on its own and not even on your period dates. So I said like, okay, uh, we'll take that on board and we'll move on. Um, and then next year I went back with tons of evidence because by that time I had sold quite a bit of underwear. I started getting testimonial. We started reaching out to the schools, um, to universities, to local council, you know, support with period pants and people who were using it. So I took all the testimonials and all the reasons like how people with learning difficulties are using period pants, how people are using for incontinence, for postpartum bleeding, you know, that all yeah. sorts of conditions that one person goes through. And, uh, and then they rejected again. So I thought this is slightly bizarre. Like how come uh, we have to pay to actually have periods um, in this day and age? So I mean, so as a business, the taxes don't affect me. I collect it from the customer and then I pass it to the government. But as a woman, it really affects me, the fact that I have, I'm having to pay to actually have period, which I really don't want to have, but I have to have it, and, and it's tax and luxury. So I took it this to the to the customer, and I said, like, look, you guys are paying 20% on VAT, on, on period pads, whereas 5% on disposable, or now 0%. How is this fair? You want to live a sustainable life, and the government is basically punishing you. So... I thought, okay, I'll start the petition and I want everybody to join it together. And I think we've got nearly 18,000 signatures. Actually, today we um, um, got a, an EDM live as well. So I joined with my MP uh, in St. Albans and she has submitted an EDM, early day motion, that's called, where the M- MP starts the petition and more MP can come and show the solidarity and escalate this to take it to the parliament and to have yeah. the VAT removed. So it's a good day <laughs> for us. Yeah. That's I feel pretty so. proud that that's from, uh, the MP is from St Albans, not going to yes. lie. <laughs> <laughs> it's amazing, uh, actually. It's yeah. really amazing. Yeah. Um, so thinking about that, I mean, I can't see how it's not going to change with all the conversation going on about climate, but... This also addresses one of the major issues to period pants, which is the price. So you mentioned earlier that people can't afford to buy um, the sanitary products, but then these are going to involve an upfront investment. So for someone listening who um, is saying, you know, I can't afford afford to drop a hundred pounds on buying enough pairs to get me through my period. So, but I can afford two pounds or what or free um as the scottish government is doing um so what would you say to that because i'm sure you get that asked that all the time and that is one of the things i've heard people saying to me a lot is i don't know you know i would need six to eight pairs and i can't afford that so tell us about how the taxing comes into that and then what your answer is to that question absolutely i mean yes uh upfront cost is quite high um and actually to, to tackle that tax and to make sure that, make the government listen, we introduced our WUCA basics, uh, which at the moment, almost all of our underwear has got the most sustainable, most uh, amazing fabric that is that is better for the environment. So we have got lensing modal, we have got organic cotton. Mm. But we did see this problem of like, people are not willing to switch because of the price. And 
And that's one of the reasons we launched uh, Wooka Basics. And they start at £12, or if you buy a pack of five, they are £10 each. And this is this has been like a huge, like, I mean, I never seen such a big growth in, in, in people buying Imperial pads as since we launched from, since we launched our Wooka Basics. It's been like literally selling so quick. And it just shows that should the price be right, there are a lot of people who are willing to change, you know? I mean, if I give you a, a, a brief number, like five pair of hooker pads actually replaces about 540 disposable pads in two years' wow. time. And if, if you are putting that in weight, it's like 4.4 kilograms of disposable weight versus 0.5% 0.5 kilograms of hooker. So that's 88% reduction in waste. So if people started thinking that way, like the pair of pads not only like saves you money, but also huge amount of waste going to landfill. Obviously, you are saving loads of money too. On average, if you spend even spend like three pounds per per pad every month, that's like thirty six pounds, right? So, um, and if you times two, seventy six. With the seventy pound, you can actually get seven pairs of underwear, which will mm-hmm. actually be more comfortable. You don't have to buy any plastics anymore. You don't have to go constantly shopping to the supermarket because you ran out of it. You know, the underwear is always there for you whenever you need it. So there are a lot of like positive side to it. And yes, price is definitely one of the biggest points. And that's one of the reasons why we created Luca Basics. And our basics as well, like they are uh, BCI sourced cotton. So we know that the, the cotton comes from an ethical market, the ethically sourced place. And uh, we are quite responsible in terms of way that whatever we do have a very little impact on the environment or the people working uh, to yeah. make it. Yeah, and I think you've hit on the right note here with regards to addressing the climate emergency in that um, for many years, the, the movement tried to use the, the big numbers, the, the, uh, the animals, the, the, uh, the wildlife, which, yes, is impactful and it should be something we think about. But at the end of the day, most of us are only really going to change if we're directly affected by something. And this is something that directly affects 50% of the population. And people often say to me, what can I do? This is a great example of something on a a very small, uh, a very, with a very small amount of change from you can make a huge difference. I mean, Ruby just said the amount of um, waste that will will not go into a landfill with this change, but also continuing the movement also um i mean i even just think in terms of of you said about comfort earlier but it affects every individual because it doesn't even feel like you are on your period i mean yes every now and again there is that sensation where Mm -hmm. um you you get like a a, some a big blob of of blood that you feel it coming out but otherwise (laughs) I mean, it it really doesn't feel like anything is happening. So I just want to emphasize that that um, this is not this episode is not intentioned to be one giant ad. And as I've said, this um, I actually have not tried Wuka, so I'm not doing this as a as a, a money making scheme or anything. It is literally, I think, this is something important and actionable that people can do all around the world, or at least in most of the people listening. Um, and you definitely have a goal of getting it all around the world. Um, so I just want to summarize that for everyone listening. Is there anything else you want to add? Uh, no, I think that's that's great, uh, the way it's said. And the period pants are not just limited to your periods, you know, like they are functional underwear. You can, from the age of eight to 10, when you have your first period to um, your throughout the period life, when you have a postpartum bleeding, where you, yeah, you I'm fine. sure that you know that, right? Because mm-hmm. people yeah. do have a bit of a blood loss for nearly for weeks. What, 40, yeah. 40 days, some people I mean, do have a, Yeah, two to three weeks, I would say. Two to three weeks, yes. Uh, so they are great for those kind of time. And mm-hmm. everybody knows that when you reach a certain age or after you have a birth of a baby, uh, you do have little leaks and it's unavoidable. Yes, you do Kegel exercise and you have other gadgets to actually work on it, but there are circumstances where actually maybe having a a, a comfy underwear that actually helps does help um, and we have I have been reached out by like runners who actually send me a like testimonial and say like 
I will pair, I will, my period comes from a marathon. You won't believe, like, I'm literally writing this. She goes like that to me. And then, um, because she couldn't go to the toilet. She had, she had to wee on her pants kind of thing. And the pants are very great. And she finished her race and without a worry. And those are like concern and comfort that you get from sometimes, you know, like it happens, shit happens, sure. right? And yeah. uh, basically you have to move on. And they are great for those moments as well. And we have customers who ask for the parents, like my, I've got elderly parents and they have got like, they can't make it to the toilet. Can this underwear be, be worn? And yes, you know, like it's a very functional underwear. And yeah, um, sad that they are taxed to but we are fighting. <laughs> yeah, no, I know. I, uh, so my listeners, can they sign the petition? Is, is, uh, is it still available? I could put a link or something. Yeah, uh, yes, you can. But I think it's from America, you can't. Uh, you have yeah. to be British. I do have some too. UK yes. listeners. Yes, so UK listeners, listeners and do it. Yes. Okay. And and if something really starts to take off in the UK, it will work its way over here. I mean, it already is. Uh, Thinks, I I believe, is is the primary uh, American brand. And hopefully, Wuka will uh, become the uh, one of the primary American brands in the in the future. Um, <laughs> okay, so uh, just to, to wrap up here, um, one final question I'd like to ask you um, about this whole experience working with the government um, or working trying to work with the government, I should say, uh, working as a CEO and a founder, um, as a woman of color, uh, have you, have you had some, uh, what has your experience been like as a, a woman of color who is a CEO when it comes to having these hard conversations? Have you experienced that, um, just approach that, that many, uh, white males do have towards, uh, women and particularly women of color who are in situations like yours? Honestly, it's been hard. Like, mm-hmm. and even so, I graduated with the with the frame of reference that okay, I'm gonna get a job here in the UK and like some desk job because before that I was just running through restaurants after restaurant, washing dishes and all this kind of any job that I got, you know, being an au pair, those kind of things. And when I did my graduation, I think I had this mindset like, oh, I'm gonna get a job, you know, like I graduated mm-hmm. from here, it should be easy. Then it took me a year and a half and knocking every doors and. Uh, trying everything I never got it there was like same qualified person as me in the interview but because she was white and I was a person of color I didn't get it and that really like hit me hard like either I I find a job that (laughs) that I don't like it but I have to work or I make a job for myself and and that's one of the reasons I started the whole VUCA and before that I did a a small project called Food with Ninjas uh, teaching children not to throw the food waste. So the both of them, I came up with, and I had to work my way around, like how I'm going to get funding and uh, and make it happen. And still now, I think it's it's very hard um, for a person of color because there's I think less opportunity, especially if you are an immigrant, you don't know many people around here. There's still that the connection, the networking work. So I have to push myself, wake myself up every morning and say like, go and push yourself, you know, like do some networking, know people, ask them. Like, this is something that I, I would say for every young entrepreneur is like, don't hesitate to ask, you know, the, the, the most you get is no, and then go to the next one and say, ask them for any, any help, any suggestion, any ideas, you know, anything that yeah. they can share. So, um, but yeah, it is, it is hard. And I don't think it will change that very easily, but but I have to keep trying and I have to keep knocking the doors, you know, so something that I would not stop. Yeah. Well, and every, every CEO who is a woman of color is, is in, I mean, I can only imagine how many women you're inspiring in the future and, and currently to do something similar. So the more of us, of you, there are, um, the better. So, um, yeah, yeah I'm, I'm, Thank I'm happy you. for you and, uh, I'm, proud to be able to give you uh, a way of of reaching out to more people so um thank we will so put, I'll put a, oh no thank you i will put a link in the show notes to uh the website um and people can go follow uh wuka on instagram what is the handle it's wuka wear at w-u-k-a-w-e-a-r yes on, on, mm-hmm. on social medias we are there and yes okay. wuka.co.uk is our website 
Okay. And then uh, with my US listeners, can you, is there a plan to, to bring more over here in the US? We already ship it to US. And I think at the moment you can get the VAT reduced price on our website, but this is something that once you get the product in the UK, you might have to pay the duty and VAT. Sometimes you get slammed quite hard, but uh, but when you buy from us, they are already VAT reduced, especially for like outside e well EU countries and in the US, Canada. But we already do ship, and we have got quite good um, fan base in America. So I'm very Great. excited about that. Yes. <laughs> yes. Well, hopefully we can get get you some more here. Thank you so much, Ruby, for. Uh, for having the courage to to make all these tough decisions in your life and for solving a problem that has been quite frankly it's shocking that it's 2021 and 20 okay let's say 2015 onwards before this got addressed but yes. uh, I want to thank you for uh, taking the time to do this and and really um, wish you the best in the future so thank you for your time no thank you very much for having me honestly like I'm glad I could share something and hopefully if anybody has got any question, you can always reach out to me. I'm pretty much open <laughs> and any help, any suggestions, you know, like business, personal, or any, any, any kind of those kind of things. Yeah. So thank you so much, Tina, for having me. I really appreciated Ruby sharing her story, that drive she has, how she's learning and just changing things for girls and women all over the world. Okay. Are you ready for the second part of the interview? Let's go meet Meg. Thank you to Momentus for sponsoring this episode of the Running For Real podcast. And I want to tell you about something a bit different today. I've been telling you about the Elite Sleep, which I was actually using quite a bit in the uh, build up to Running Realized. I had so much going on in my brain that I had to do and needed to think about that I was struggling to fall asleep. And so I was using the Elite Sleep. I really, really appreciated that uh, recently. And then I have told you about the creatine, uh, performance creatine, and also about the collagen in the past. But today I want to tell you about Brain Drive. So Brain Drive is a daily supplement de developed to optimize brain function and support long-term brain health. It's going to promote focus, motivation, positivity, and learning by combining these doses of research-backed ingredients that support the production of dopamine and acetylcholine, I think I'm saying that correctly, um, which are known as neurotransmitters. Those are responsible for how the cells in your brain communicate. Um, I have recently been trying this out and I found it really helpful for keeping me focused and just it kind of feels like it's giving you a bit of a secret weapon, or at least for me, um, particularly as I do feel quite scattered at times. Um, this has been helping me to, to stay focused on a task. I'm working on something pretty important, which I will be announcing soon. And before I found I was bouncing around, finding excuses to do other things, but it's really been helping me to, to stick on one task. And so um, it's got things like niacin, vitamin B6, vitamin B9, B12, um, and some other things that I don't know what they are, but they are, they're not strange ingredients. They are things you will all recognize. Um, and I have read a little bit about them, but don't worry, they're not some strange random ingredients. They are all natural things. So you can check out livemomentous.com and you can use code TINA to get yourself 20% off. You can also check out the collagen, the creatine and the elite sleep while you're at it. Um, and I just love what Live Momentous is doing. Uh, I will be making some more announcements sometime soon about some of the things they are doing. But in the meantime, go check out that brain drive at livemomentous.com. Use code TINA for 20% off. Megan, thank you so much for joining me back on the Running Field podcast. I'm excited to catch up and uh, check in with something that neither of us have talked about in this concept, in this way before. Thank you so much. It's an honor to be on here. And I'm just really excited you're highlighting this topic. I think we need a lot more discussion on this and I'm, I'm just pumped for everything ahead. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you. And uh, I feel like me in particular, I should have addressed this a long time ago, seeing as I feel like my name was associated with the word period for <laughs> maybe still is, but for many years. So um, it's kind of bad that I haven't addressed this other than I did with Stacey Sims for anyone who wants to go back and listen to that one. There is one in the past where I did cover that. But okay, so um, I'm going to refer people to episode 109, which was the episode I interviewed you and your husband, David, um, to learn more about you if they haven't already heard. But we want to dive straight in today to talk about periods, something that 50% uh, of the population experiences, yet 
uh, there's still a massive cultural bar- barrier and just um, a embarrassment uh, about this topic. So I would love for you just in your line of work to talk about um, the differences you see v- when someone comes to see you about the the clinical side of this versus what you see in you know, society as a whole and just the rest of the world. Absolutely. So I'm just so glad we're talking about this. So I think for me, the first word that comes to mind is taboo. And I think, unfortunately, this still is a taboo topic. I see a lot of athletes who come to talk to me as a coach, as a physician, as a researcher, just even have uh, trouble formulating the words to describe their period, to describe their menstrual yeah. cycle, just because yeah. it's something that they're not used to talking about. Um, the other thing I would say, too, that I see quite often is, is that we think of this menstrual cycle sometimes as like this textbook thing. You know, we have these set phases, we have ovulation, we have the period. But what I would say is, is that I see a lot of variation in the menstrual cycle. Some of that is natural, some of that is related to running, some of that is related to underfueling. Some of that is related to contraception and other choices. And I think there's just so many different ways in which athletes experience the menstrual cycle. And talking about this more and more is just going to help athletes be able to to vocalize what they're experiencing. Exactly. And have you seen any changes over the last, I don't know, uh, well, since you've, since you've been working as a physician, any, um, has there been any growth in, or improvement in that, uh, just ability to be able to talk about it without cringing? I think for sure. So I think for me, social media is kind of this mixed bag. I see a lot of Mm -hmm. comparison things go on in social media, but I do think that social media has raised the awareness about topics related to mental health and topics related to the menstrual cycle, the period, and makes people a little bit like more comfortable to talk about these things. So while I think it's still, it's still a taboo topic, I think we've really elevated the field forward in the ability to talk about this. The other thing that I see too is, is working as a coach. I've seen that a lot more coaches, especially due to the work by Stacey Sims, who highlights kind of training around the menstrual cycle, training with the menstrual cycle, I've seen a lot more coaches just straight out asking athletes and talking about the menstrual cycle as this very early conversation in the coaching process. Mm -hmm. Yes. And absolutely love that you highlighted Stacey Sims because, uh, I mean, she's definitely the leader in our industry with, with this, uh, women are not small men, uh, hashtag and, and conversation that she starts. And, um, I definitely encourage people to go check her out if you haven't already. All right. So give us a a rundown just briefly on the the phases of the period for for someone who is still just a little bit confused by, by how this works. Absolutely. So there's a few different ways to think about the phases of the the menstrual cycle. So we can start with kind of what the eggs are doing in the body and then what the uterine lining is doing in the body. And we can kind of track that in parallel. Um, So the classic menstrual cycle is around 28 days. But again, I talked about variation. We see so much variation in that. It can vary between individuals. It can vary within the same athlete. So lots of variation in that. And it's okay if you don't fall on that classic 28 day timeline. Um, So to start is the follicular phase, and that's defining what the egg is doing. So the egg is a follicle. Um, And um, that kind of happens over the first 14 days is that that follicle is growing, it's developing, it's nurturing this egg. Um, Around 14 days, we have ovulation. Um, And around the time of ovulation, actually, we see a spike in hormones, the luteinizing hormone and the follicular the follicle stimulating hormone FSH um, and estrogen also spikes around this time too. And so sometimes athletes can have some symptoms around ovulation related to these rising hormones. Ovulation generally lasts around one to two days, but that's very variable in athletes. Um, so after that 14 day mark of ovulation, we then move into the luteal phase. Um, and that's defined by the fact that this egg is becoming this corpus luteum um, and is continuously to develop it. It's you know, released from the follicle during ovulation. Um, and that, that luteal phase extends all the way to menses. Um, and the start of the menstrual cycle is considered, you know, we start back at day one um, when we do start our periods. And that's something that a lot of athletes are not aware of. In that luteal phase is when progesterone and estrogen are a little bit higher. um, And that classically defines some of the premenstrual symptoms that many athletes experience during the luteal phase or right before the period starts. Um, So things like feeling a little bit more tired, feeling bloated. Sometimes I see athletes feel like they're hyperventilating even a little bit um, when when they're working out. But what I love about the period is once you get your period, your hormones start to trend down a little bit. And I refer to this as your RAR phase because it's kind of an optimized phase for competition. And not something a lot of a lot of athletes know is that when you get your period, you're actually like primed and ready for competition. I think that's something that's really exciting and cool. Yeah, and actually that that was definitely something I was going to um, ask about, and, and I'm glad you went into that. Just one thing to just clarify: so uh, 
you said with the follicular stages, so the the bleed itself falls into that first 14 days. So yes. day one is day one of your period, oh. like the bleed? Okay. Yeah, so day one of the follicular phase is, is day, one, day one of bleeding. So you're having men okay. during the follicular phase. Um, mm-hmm. And that's something that actually not a lot of athletes are aware of is, is the start of that. Okay. All right. Thank you. And so let's, yeah, let's dive into that. Um, I was going to ask that if that was a myth that, um, we have heard, uh, some, I, I have definitely heard many times, but, um, I'm sure listeners have as well that, uh, actually being on your period is rather than it being a, Oh no, it's happening. I don't feel good. I'm, I'm not going to run well. Should I cancel my run? Should I cancel my race? Uh, you're saying that actually the opposite, this is when you're, uh, yeah, prime to actually be yeah ag- ag- aggressive and feisty and go after those big goals you have. Yeah, which is such an exciting thing. Yeah, and that the result of that is because the rising progesterone and estrogen that, gen that we see, um, and you know during the PMS phase during during the luteal phase drops down when you get your period. And so that creates this environment where athletes can have really strong performances, can feel great, can feel supercharged. Um, and it's something that I tell athletes, it's very, very empowering. I think mm-hmm. one thing that athletes may struggle with when they have their period is sometimes these PMS symptoms can continue into the period. So mm-hmm. things like cramping, things like just feeling a little bit slightly off, but it's helpful to know that even if you do experiencing, if you are experiencing these symptoms on your period, that it's still this like strong time to, to perform and to, you know, to get out there and compete. So you would say even if someone has some strong symptoms, they don't feel good, they really are, you know, uncomfortable getting out there as they feel, you know, that voice in their head is saying, uh, well, maybe I should just take a rest day. You are saying that actually you may end up finding you feel a lot better, not only afterwards, but during. Correct. Correct. Um, the okay. exciting thing too is, is that, um, so cramping is such a common experience that athletes feel during PMS phase, even when they're on their period and actually the increased blood flow, um, like throughout your body that you get while running can be a great solution for cramping. It can really help. And that's something that I've seen athletes kind of thrive off of as well is knowing that if they get out the door, that it actually may help with some of their cramps. Mm, yeah. Good to know. Thank you. Okay. So let's talk about the logistics there. So you've just said that, um, you know, it's, it's not only uh, a time we should be getting out just because, uh, this is not the time to say, I don't, I don't think I should be doing this. It's not good for my body, but it is actually the opposite. It is good for your body, but the, um, let's talk about actually running the logistics of running on a period. Now, um, this episode is f- focusing on reusables, getting people to consider using a menstrual cup, using the reusable uh, running underwear, uh, period underwear. Um, However, in my (laughs) quest to convince as many people as I can to use those products, there's a lot of um, fears that go around with those um, compared with using tampons or or pads. So uh, in Primarily on, you know, fear of of bleeding through, fear of um, chafing, of things not going uh, as they should be. Uh, and yeah, so can you just talk about the difference between the two from a, um, a medical clinical um, perspective and then um, your thoughts on um, those fears that people are talking about? Yeah, actually, I think first I'll start with the fears just because it can ha- kind of help where this conversation goes. Mm-hmm. So I think the way that I think about the menstrual cycle and getting your period itself is that it's really no different than any other bodily fluid that we have. I think, you know, you see marathon pictures and people are finishing with, you know, they may have, you know, have bowel movements during the race. They may have urine, like running is a hard sport and like inevitably we are going to have body fluids. And I just, I always encourage athletes to think of period blood as no different than any other bodily fluid. And I think that's something that really helps athletes conceptualize. Um, and so it is okay. Like even if you do have from using some of these products, whether it's a tampon, whether it's a silicone cup, whether there's any of these different things that I think it is actually okay. Like if you do have some blood showing, like that's a like RAR, that is a positive thing. Um, you know, this is just another type of bodily fluid. It's not something to be scared of. Um, and then speaking between the difference between tampons, silicone cups, pads, all of these different options, I think it's really just personal preference. I don't think there's a performance benefit of one versus the other. And I think it really just comes down to individual comfort, what you've practiced. Certainly if you're racing, I would go into the race with something that you've practiced during, you know, long runs during training days. Um, and I think it's just a really comes down to a matter of personal preference. The, the silicon cup and some of these other options, speaking of the reusable underwear, are more sustainable options for the environment and something that I encourage athletes to think about. Um, but again, it really just gets down to personal preference. So I'd love to, to, to go into that just a little bit more, that personal preference aspect, because I think that is the, the 
the heart or the the biggest issue that people have. So you said going into races with something you've practiced. However, only having, you know, let's say five days a month to practice. So you, um, but you don't know where those, well, you do know when those are going to come, but it may not come during a, a week where you can do a long run. Or you may have, let's say you have a five month build up to a race. You only have a few opportunities to test that out. Maybe you only have one or two heavy days per month. Um, and so one or two days per month to test that, which maybe makes people nervous. And that's a lot of what I've found talking to other people that they want to stick to tampons or pads because they they know how that works and they know their body. So um, are there any thoughts that you have on, you know, yeah, you can test it out during your training runs, but um, in your experience, have you found there is, there is a learning curve with these newer sustainable products that uh, you almost have to push through in the same way that you would try things in training and, you know, maybe uh, something doesn't feel quite right at the start, but then you get used to it and then you think, actually, I prefer this. Um, I've definitely felt that to be the case with my cup that I, um, the first few months I was like, I don't know if I can do this. This is not really working for me. But then I kept trying and then it's, it almost clicked in many ways. Have you, do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, absolutely. So I love that. So I actually encourage athletes, both from the standpoint of the logistics of the periods, but also from a confidence building standpoint to sometimes schedule workouts during the PMS phase, during, during the time when you actually have your period, because it can be confidence building. You're like, okay, well, I know I hit that workout. I can show up on race day, whatever race day is going to be in the time of my cycle. And sometimes athletes don't have a good track of their cycle and they kind of have to play it by year. Um, but as a coach, it's actually something that I really encourage athletes to do in terms of the logistics. I think that, you know, whatever you can do to, it doesn't necessarily have to be that you have to practice this exact mechanism that you're planning to use, whether it's a tampon or a silicon cup in the long run or workout yourself, even just like walking around, going on hikes can get you the feel of how your body feels like moving around with whatever it is, you know, that you're planning to use. And I think that's something that athletes really appreciate. Um, the other thing I would say too, is, is like getting back to like the whole conversation about bodily fluids, like having other like mechanisms that can help, um, in case the device doesn't work perfectly is really helpful. So sometimes I know I've been in a trial race before and maybe it's like a really heavy period day. And I'm like, I don't know if this tampon is going to hold, you know, everything that, you know, my body, like during my menstrual cycle, I wear black shorts. And I feel like that gives me the added confidence that it's like, okay, like, you know, I know that like, it's just going to be absorbed into my black shorts and isn't going to be noticeable. But again, even if it was blue shorts, it's like, you know, I think at some point I have to get used to like rocking that with pride. Yeah. And I, I know there's a, there was a woman who did the London marathon, um, uh, maybe three or four years ago and she decided to free bleed and, uh, she got loads of publicity for it. And I know she, she's all over. I actually reached out to her about, um, about, uh, coming on the show about having her as a guest in addition to you. Um, and, uh, she had so much going on. So she's definitely, um, doing her part to, to get the word out about that. But, um, I just, you know, I'd love to hear your insights as, as not so much from the physician side of things, but from the, just, um, a coach and a runner and someone who has, you know, an ear into the industry. Um, I did actually put an Instagram post up a few months ago about, um, because I went that nine years without having a period. And then I fell pre and then I fell pregnant with my first daughter had, I don't know, six periods or six, uh, bleeds and then, and then f pregnant again. And now I've, uh, post second daughter, I've had maybe two. So in many ways, I'm a teenage girl with, <laughs> with, with where I'm at, with my understanding of how things work and my body, um, and just that experience. And so I posted about having got it wrong and I, you know, bleed, bled all the way through my, my running pants. And it was, clearly visible when I got back to my house and, and first feeling that sense of embarrassment of like, oh, you couldn't even like figure this out. People would have seen you, you know, like, uh, what would they think? Um, but then I had to stop myself and say exactly what you said earlier. It's a bodily fluid. Why am I concerned? Um, you know, anyone who would see something and think it either has a woman in their life who is going through that as well. So they should be able to look at it in a different perspective. Or if they're a teenage boy who doesn't understand that, you know, they've got enough awkward things in their own life <laughs> that, they, that I don't need to be concerned with what they're thinking. So, um, I just love to, yeah, hear your thoughts on the, on the cultural, um, perspective of this in that it's 2021 and you and I both haven't talked about this in this way. Um, 
And and yet we've said 50% of the population goes uh, through this. We, I mean, we talked about uh, in the first half of this episode with Ruby talking about the experiences she had, but America isn't that much or the Western countries are not that much further ahead because it, as we've said, it's still taboo. What are your thoughts there? I love this. So when I think when I, when I think about this topic, I often think about starting from the physiology itself. So my husband and I did a podcast on this topic and we spent like the first 15 minutes going through the physiology of like what is actually going on in the menstrual cycle kind of in a light version or in a heavier version of what I did today on the podcast. And I feel like once you dig down into the science of it, it's like holy crap, what our bodies are doing is so beautiful. Like the cascades mm-hmm. of hormones that are coming together in order to produce this menstrual cycle um, are a really, really beautiful thing. And I think that's something that's not talked about enough is this, like what's going on beneath the surface is this unbelievable, incredible physiology. And I think like, I think centering some of these conversations around that topic can be really helpful for removing some of the stigma related to this topic. Mm -hmm. Um, I think the other thing is, is just that it is natural. Like I think even if I finished a run and I, sometimes I have this where like I have um, urine leakage during a run, sometimes I finish and I like feel self-conscious. And then I think what I reinforce to athletes is like, it's okay. It's natural to feel embarrassed. Like that is a natural response. It's okay. But we can take that response and choose action. So we can choose that to be like, you know, this, this embarrassment or something I'm having, like I can change turn that around and say, Hey, I'm going to feel empowered by this. I'm going to empower others in the process. Um, Mm -hmm. and it's really just like meditating on that response and taking action in a way that's like empowering for other people, empowering for you and recognizing the beauty of the physiology. So what would be your suggestion to someone listening who's hearing this and saying, okay, what can I do? Would it be talking to the men in their life and, uh, you know, rather than it just being, um, I'm going to the bathroom because I've got something to do, uh, talking about it in more detail, what would you suggest? I think that's a very individual thing, but I think it starts with just opening up the conversation with people who are close around you. So, you know, talking about what you're going through, talking about some of the symptoms that you may be having, talking about like, even just like empowering yourself to understand the physiology behind the menstrual cycle and behind some of these hormones. And then framing it in that language can be really helpful too, especially if like the language doesn't come easy at first. So I think the start is doing it with those close around you, your girlfriends, like, you know, whether it's a partner in your life, like friends, whoever it may be, a coach, um, your doctor. And then I think from there, there can be a subset of people, like if you're comfortable about it, I think talking about it on podcasts, talking about it on social media, blogs, all of these things just furthers the dialogue and, and really helps um, contribute in this field. Yes, absolutely. And, uh, and thank you for sharing that. So um, before I just want to, I want to go a little bit deeper into, um, you know, so, some of the questions that prompted me to do this episode in the first place. But uh, before we go any further, I want to just address something that I've spoken about many times. Stacey Sims spoke about this when she came on my podcast to talk about that. Um, the idea, you know, so I'm, my name is very much associated with amenorrhea, red S, not having a period. Um, but a lot of people, when I tell them that, uh, them being on birth control and saying, well, I have a bleed at the end of each month. That means I'm fine. Um, can you just tell us about, uh, how birth control works, uh, at least the oral versions and, um, why women listening may, may not actually be getting a period, even if they think that bleeding is happening. And so they are. Absolutely. This is a fantastic topic. And one that I think is often misrepresented, um, in the public dialogue and literature and and even in the conversations between coaches and athletes. And so I'm so glad you're bringing attention to this. So I think, um, for me with oral contraceptives, there's different formulations. So, um, there's formulations with estrogen and progesterone formulations with progesterone only. And the way that this works is, is that it kind of sets an athlete's hormones at this set level. And then, um, when they take the placebo pills during, um, the time when they would be getting their period, it allows this period to happen. And if they were under fueling, they can be getting their period as a result of taking the oral contraceptives, even though their body may not be physiologically able to handle a period. Mm-hmm. Um, and for physicians, for coaches, for athletes, the, the feedback of having a period is very helpful because it allows you to understand if you're getting enough fueling for your body. Um, and it's and it one of those one of those areas. And so I think in this in this light, oral contraceptives can actually be be very difficult um, for some athletes um, to have that feedback mechanism of whether or 
or not they're feeling appropriately. Um, the same goes for IUDs. Um, so many different types of IUDs. And um, for some athletes, they may cause bleeding for a period of time. Um, they may also cause um, amenorrhea. And that's the result of the IUD. But it's very hard for an athlete to tell which phase of the cycle she may be in and then if she's also feeling enough. So is there a way of knowing that without just coming off it, uh, you know, coming off the oral contraceptive or taking the IUD out? So with the oral contraceptives, it's very challenging to know. With the IUD, you can do some tracking of um, your basal body temperature to kind of know what phase of the cycle you're in. Some athletes may be actually getting their period on an IUD. So an IUD is actually very individual specific. Um, for uh, oral contraceptives, it is challenging to know if, you're, if, you know if your body is physiologically able to handle a natural period. What I encourage a lot of athletes, um, if they'd like to stay on oral contraceptives, is to work with a nutritionist and really dial in your nutrition, dial in kind of what you're doing. Um, and that can kind of be helpful. But I think, um, you know, the nice thing about contraceptives is we've made a lot of progress in science of offering a wide range of contraceptives. Um, and so athletes can have choices, especially if they're thinking deeply about, um, you know, making sure they're not under fueling and things like this. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. All right. I appreciate that. And, um, I have gone over this in previous episodes. So if someone does want to learn more about this, um, uh, Dr. Jennifer Gaudiani, I'll put that link in the show notes and then also uh, Heidi Greenwood and Nic Nicola Rinaldi. Um, all right. So being a coach, um, you understand that it is especially, especially important for women to talk to their coach about uh, everything that's going on with, with them and the importance of saying how they're feeling, talking about those symptoms, talking about the phases. Um, just talk about from a perspective of, of yeah, your position as a coach, um, what would you encourage athletes to um, share with their coach or to get comfortable uh, talking about um, with their own running and where they are in their menstrual cycle? I love this. So I think oftentimes it's easiest for the dialogue to start from the coach. So I empower coaches to, you know, talk, talk with their athletes about this. Um, it can really open up by coming from the coach. It can really open up that free flowing dialogue. And then for athletes, like if your coach hasn't asked about this in specific, it can be a really helpful thing to bring up and say, Hey, this is what I experience on my period. These are the days I have my period. These are the symptoms. This is how I feel when I'm performing. And then developing a system between athlete and coach where you can track that over time. Because what I've seen for athletes is, is that sometimes the menstrual cycle, you know, it varies. Um, like one menstrual, you know, when you, when you get your period one time, it may feel very different in a training perspective from a logistics perspective than when you get a period another time. And really tracking that with a coach is helpful. Um, so what I have my athletes do is, is I coach athletes in a Google training spreadsheet. So we use, you know, a Google sheet and they often put stars in on the day of the period. And then I encourage them to write in symptoms they may be feeling. And we can kind of get a good sense for how things are trending over time. And then also predict where an athlete may be um, in, their, in their menstrual cycle before race. And I think both of those are very helpful. Yeah. Yeah. I love that. That's really good. And, um, thank you. Thank you for sharing that. And, um, you know, I, I would, I'd like to hear your thoughts on this, but I would personally say that if someone listening were to try and talk to their coach and explain some of these things, and particularly if that coach is a male who says, you know, I don't need to hear these things. Um, this is not relevant to me. You know, that's not affecting your training. Uh, that might be a good time to, to reconsider that relationship because if, uh, you know, part of breaking down this stigma of this conversation is we have to be able to talk to men about this conversation about, about this topic, um, to remove that stigma. Um, and if men, you know, uh, if men are not prepared to, to learn and to listen, um, then, that might be a um, something that you would want to address in the future. Would you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, absolutely. So my husband, David, is a coach and coaches many female athletes. And so we've actually talked about this, how he talks to female athletes about it, how he creates this open environment. And I think for him, he couches it in terms of performance at the start. And I think that's something that really just furthers the dialogue. Um, mm -hmm. I encourage athletes to, you know, if you're talking to a male coach and feeling uncomfortable about it, framing it in the context of performance at the start may be a great way to launch into this conversation. Because I mean, every coach should be concerned about an athlete's performance. And if a coach understands how you're feeling around the menstrual cycle related to performance, it can just, it can really help them contextualize the importance of this. The other yeah. thing too, is, is if a male coach is struggling to understand, I think sending some research articles related to the underlying physiology can be very mm -hmm. helpful. Um, again, getting back to the beauty of like what the body is doing, what the internal hormones are doing, um, as a woman goes through their menstrual cycle. Thank you. And would you be prepared to send me a few of those I can put in the show notes for people if they are, you know, getting ready to have this conversation? 
Yeah, absolutely. And at the start, actually, I would say that I've tried to get every male coach that I advise on this topic to read Stacey Sims' book, Raw, because yes. I think it breaks it down in a very helpful way. The science is digestible. It's easy to understand. Um, but then it also, so the, the book goes through a lot of the different variations related to the menstrual cycle. So things like, um, you know, primary amenorrhea, secondary amenorrhea, um, it goes into menopause, all of these different things. And I think it's just a very helpful, comprehensive look at this topic. Mm-hmm. Okay, great. Thank you. Okay. So I have to ask, I think about, um, uh, I recently heard the term mutt run. I've never heard of that, like mountain <laughs> ultra trail. Yeah. Um, and, uh, so when it comes to, to mutt runners, I, I, I've just, the reason this whole episode came about was because I just could not figure out how ultra athletes work their way through. You've just said that, you know, you perform best on your uh, have the potential to perform best on your period. Um, and I, so I would imagine ultra runners wouldn't want to be like, I'm going to try and, you know, use birth control to delay mine. I'm going to try and change things. Uh, they would embrace that, but then the logistics of being out there for that long. And, you know, you're often maybe in the woods where you, you know, the, uh, why, um, where sanitary concerns may be <laughs> a problem or hygiene. So how how do people do that? I'm I'm just dying to know. <laughs> yeah, so this I think this question gets back to the idea that period blood is just another bodily fluid. And honestly, when you think about 50 mile races, 100 Ks, 100 mile races, you're going to have a lot of bodily fluid. Like that is inherent in the event itself. Yeah. And the best ultra runners have to embrace that. So, you know, if you're running a hundred mile race, you are going to be peeing, you're going to be pooping, you're going to be, you know, hopefully not vomiting, but, you know, having all of these bodily fluids go on during the race and period blood is just another one of those. Um, so I encourage athletes who are racing with their period, racing a hundred mile race with their period, you know, get really quick and efficient at changing out your tampon, your silicon cup, whatever it may be. Um, also having extra shorts, extra clothing can be helpful. Um, things to reduce chafing. So squirrels, nut butter makes an amazing chafe product that a lot of mm-hmm. ultra runners use, um, not sponsored by them, but it's amazing. So no, I've used it as well. It's great. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I think like, I think just being prepared for it and also understanding it's just another variable on the day. And that's, that's what I love about ultra racing. There's so many variables that go on to go on into a race and a period is just another one of those. Would you say the, that com- the ultra trail, uh, mountain community is em- embraces it more than, uh, like even within the, the males, um, and just the, the community aspect? That's a great point. I think they do. I think because in 100 mile races, like the norm is for something to go wrong. Like there's just so many things that happen to people during 100 mile races that someone having period blood, you know, is not like that is not out of the norm at all. In fact, actually we had a top ultra runner win Bandera 100 K and she fell and broke her nose and there was blood everywhere. And she was a registered nurse and actually stuck a tampon, um, like the the tampon of her nose to stop the blood. And it was like, I thought it was such a beautiful thing just to highlight, you know, the power of tampons, the power of being creative, but also just, like all the stuff that goes on in these longer races. Mm -hmm. Yeah, such a good point. And yeah, I did hear about that. Okay. So just to wrap up here, is there anything else we haven't talked about that you think is important to mention or that listeners can do to really stop this being a taboo topic? Yeah. So I'll start with the the taboo taboo topic itself. So I think just like really, as we talked about emphasizing the power of connecting um, with friends, with partners, with coaches on this topic. And once you start this conversation once, I find the subsequent conversations are much easier. And I think that's something that's really helpful to arm yourself with is is, it's really just about talking about it and kind of like running, getting started is the hardest part. Um, And then I think the second point is, is getting back to the performance element of this, knowing that like your performance on the period on your period is likely going to be strong. Like that is a raw phase. It's time to embrace it, but also looking at some of the research in the premenstrual, um, you know, in the premenstrual phase, when you may be experiencing a little bit more symptoms, there's actually interesting and variable research right now that go, that shows that there's no real changes in VO2 max or lactate threshold, which are these performance variables. Um, and it's really about how athletes are feeling feeling at those, um, you know, at those measurements. And that's something that I really encourage athletes is that research shows that the science shows that, you know, you can be strong during the PMS phase, during the period phase. And that's something just to arm yourself with and be excited with, um, understanding like the underlying beauty of all of this different physiology. 
Yes, thank you so much. I I truly appreciate you coming on to talk about this. Um, and uh, yeah, in addition to all the things that you do in the in the running world to to support runners and to just help them with performance, I'm sure your athletes especially feel grateful for you. Uh, you can find Megan and David on the an episode uh, 109 of Running Free. All. They also have their own podcast, which I definitely recommend. It is a, a fan favorite. Uh, Some work or play podcast. Uh, your book, The Happy Runner, I have read and loved and we covered that in the episode we had uh i had you on uh anywhere else you would like people to go to to find you no that's fantastic uh thank you so much and just so grateful for how you've shifted this dialogue and bringing attention to all these things so really really grateful for you tina thank you before we end this episode, I just want to take a moment to shout out my podcast editor, Jeremy Nessel, who has done such a wonderful job of looking after my podcast, taking out all the mis- mishaps in the episodes, while still keeping in the the vulnerability and the realness and the rawness of the conversation. This is not one of those podcasts where I take out the ums and the ers and the the sometimes the delay in, in words, because I think it's very important to keep that authenticity. We're surrounded by perfected and manicured everything and I think it's really important that running for real stays that way so thank you to Jeremy for your work I also want to thank Maria Vargas and Amber Moore who are also part of my team they've been a big part of this community and me being able to build this brand so just want to give them a shout out too all right let's get right back to the end of this episode That episode was definitely long overdue, but I hope you enjoyed it and I hope you appreciated listening to that and learning. I definitely learned a lot from both of those. And it's really interesting to hear, particularly with Ruby, about the different cultures and how we, yes, things have changed. And yes, we may be approaching things differently. As she mentioned, things have changed for them, but we also have a long way to go. And I wanted to make that a focus here to see that we can make changes. And yes, they'll be a little bit uncomfortable, but we're runners. We know what that feels like. So we can do these things. And then with Meg, I hope that was very helpful for you uh, with the logistics, with trying to figure out how we negotiate this and just having a bit of a general conversation to destigmatize things. Um, I hope you enjoyed that conversation with her. I will put links in the show notes to everything we talked about today, all the all the two guests that I had on, all the things we talked about, the links that we mentioned. Um, Wuka, you can go check that out if you are in the UK. Um, and you can actually also get that in US as well. Um, and I just want to thank our sponsors for this episode, which are Gooder, You Can, and Momentus. So Gooder, you can get 15% off your order by going to Gooder, G-O-O-D-R dot com forward slash Tina, 15% off with by clicking on that link. Uh, you Can, you can get 20% off your order by using code Tina, you can at you can.co. And Momentous, you can get 20% off your order by going to livemomentous.com and using code TINA. So my friends, that is about it for this episode. Remember, there is a new episode of Running Realize coming on Monday. So go subscribe if you haven't already. And if you wouldn't mind leaving a rating and review for either podcast, I would really appreciate it. And uh, I will see you next Friday. Thanks for listening.